whoever is listening, guys, welcome back to another episode of the Man with the Plan podcast. The Boston Celtics have made the NBA Finals, and I needed reinforcements. If you guys remember Jack Simone from last year, we were talking Celtics 76ers, and now Jack is going to be covering the NBA Finals. Jack, how are you feeling, bud? Glad to have you back on for another playoff run. Hey, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Uh, I appreciate your flexibility. I was telling Grayson beforehand. I've been scrambling, so it took took me a while to sit down and get here. But now that we're here, I'm, I'm happy to talk Celtics, happy to talk basketball. So you mentioned that scrambling process. I'd love to sort of get into the, the travel that this postseason has sort of brought to you. I, if I'm correct, you've been to Miami, Cleveland, and Indiana. How has that worked? What has that process been like? And just take the audience through what it's like covering this postseason for the Celtics. Yeah, this is my first year traveling uh, to cover the road games for the playoffs, so it's been pretty fun. Um, I, I'm paying my way through the process, so I'm trying to save as much money as I can. So we drove to Cleveland and drove to Indiana. So me and a few friends uh, on the, the Celtics beat um, carpooled there, split the driving. It was nine hours to Cleveland, nine hours there, nine hours back, 14 hours to Indiana there and back. So it was a lot of, a lot of time in the car, long days. Um, but it was really, really good time. Super fun environments to be in in Cleveland, in Indiana. Um, Miami was good too. Uh, I flew there. Obviously, didn't <laughs> didn't drive to Indiana. I'm not that crazy, but uh, it, it's been a super fun process. It's been a really cool experience. My first year doing it, uh, and I'm I'm very excited to get to do it again for the finals. And Jackson went for Celtics blog, part of the SB Nation. Uh, taking big swings here with the, it's been a crazy year for Boston. Uh, I, I was really curious and I've been following your work guys. If you haven't checked out Jack's work, he also brilliantly called that the Knicks are going to take down the Sixers got a <laughs> lot of flack for it, but stood on his ground, stood on his business as we'll say, and got that right. But Jack for such a big year for Boston, before we get into the finals talk, potential matchups, the media part of it, just how did you sort of approach this year? There was a lot of changes in the offseason. Marcus Smart obviously shipped off for Porzingis. You bring in Drew Holiday. The expectations could not be more insurmountable and in just the scope of what this team was building. So for you, before the season started, how do you sort of approach that as a beat writer and saying, how can I make sure that I keep my head on a swivel? Because I, I feel like it could be really easy to get sucked into the noise, sucked into the energy with such a with a team that had such big expectations. And now they've reached to that point or four games away from largely meeting everybody's point of where they thought Boston would be. How did you approach that this year? Yeah, it's such a weird phenomenon, this team, because it, it feels like nobody can really enjoy it. Like none of the fans are appreciating the wins. They're not appreciating how good the Celtics team has been because every every win is like expected so every time the Celtics win it's just like a relief like oh cool they did what they're supposed to do but every time they lose it's like the end of the world like they've lost I think 20 games this year in total all season including the playoffs and it from the way that people talk about the Celtics and the way that fans like treat the Celtics you'd think they would have lost double that amount um and so it's it's almost frustrating at times to see how they're covered in the national media and how even local fans treat it. Like you'll, you'll listen to the crowd at TD garden in the playoffs and it'll be all smiles, all happy at the start of the game. The Celtics will go on a huge run and it'll be, it'll be great. But as soon as like the Pacers or a team goes on, even a six, nothing run, the crowd goes silent and it's like, you can feel the panic and it's just, they, they don't really have any room for error. And so that's a little frustrating, but I think the biggest thing for me throughout the season was sort of understanding that this is a different team. Like, yeah, Tatum and Brown are still here. And, that, and that's what's going to make everybody think like, oh, this is the same team, same expectations. Like, can they finally get it done? But by and large, this is a completely different team than they've had in years past. There's no Marcus Smart. There's no Robert Williams. There's no Grant Williams. There's, you know, Peyton Pritchard's in a larger role. Sam Hauser's in a larger role. Cornette's playing real minutes. Drew Holiday is here. Christophs Porzingis is here. Al Horford is still here as well. But like, in terms of the chemistry in terms of the roster, in terms of Joe Mazzulla finally having like a summer and a full season under his belt instead of just being thrown into the fire, this is a completely different team with completely different experiences and a completely different mindset going into the postseason especially. And, and so I think you really have to treat it as such. And um, I've been really impressed with the way they've carried themselves all season. And they've almost been too boring to the point where their success is taken for granted. Like the, every time they win, they're just like, yeah, on to the next and they do the same thing after they lose like they have the same exact responses and mindset win or losses and so you really have to dig in deeper to find stories and ways to cover the team and, and little niches because they've been so head down business minded uh, and that's a good thing and you're seeing that in the playoffs but 
I, I think fans need to to appreciate it a bit more, to be honest. Is there a moment this season that maybe it was in the regular season where you the, the whole the I think the logo or the slogan for Boston, it's it's different here. I see it on Twitter all the time, but when did you start to see that? Was it game one against the Knicks? Was it a point in the regular season where you may have overcame a certain obstacle or developed a certain characteristic where you thought, yeah, we've heard about it all offseason, but yeah, this on with my own eyes, I can see it. This team is different than years past. I think you definitely saw it throughout the beginning portions of uh, portions of the season. Um, I wrote at the beginning of March, uh, I wrote the Celtics are basketball robots. Um, and it was after their 50 point or 50, whatever point win over the Warriors. And I think you saw it before that, but after that happened, the quotes and everything that came out of it was just like, yeah, like this is, this is insane. What the Celtics team is doing. Joe Mazzula had a quote after that game. He said, we show up here, we play the game. It's the most important thing that we have to do is play the game. And when it's over, nobody cares. Like they just beat the Warriors by 52 points on their home floor, on the Celtics home floor at TD garden. And Joe Mazzula was just like, yeah, whatever like it's over who cares like like that, that that just stuck out to me as like wow this team like they truly don't care about anything but winning and Christoph Porzingis in the preseason had an awesome quote that I think has sort of described the entire season from that point on and I put it in my article that I wrote after they made the finals um, which I I titled um, the Celtics long road to the NBA finals and the longer road that lies ahead he said um, something along the lines of we understand. Oh yeah. We understand what our goal is, but we don't want to only have the goal in mind. Like we have to live the lifestyle. We have to live day to day, like uh, basically understanding that like the goal is a championship, but you can't think about that. Like the, if you think about the only goal being a championship, you won't appreciate it and, and focus on winning every individual game. And so while they get what they're trying to do, they're not focusing on the title. They're just focusing on winning, winning every game in front of them. And that's, I feel like why they play like robots, which is a very good thing for a team with this much talent. Yeah, and I, I think that it, every, every press conference I get a chance to every time, and you guys can follow Jack on Twitter. I'll have it linked in our thumbnail on our border and also put it in the description as you guys go check out his finals coverage there. But it, it seems like every press conference, win or lose, whether they lose to Miami by 20 in the postseason or Jalen Brown drops 40 on, in game two against Indiana, it's very, it, it follows a very set script. Uh, you can almost get the words before, out of their mouths before they even speak it. And so I feel like that mentality sort of carried them through this game. But I'd love to talk about Joe Mazzula real quick for a second, because I feel like last year there was a lot of him under the microscope taking over for Udoka in a very, very controversial summer and coming in sort of thrown to the fire, like you said. But what has been the most notice noticeable difference for him in year two? Obviously, you said he's had time to get his feet wet, get his feet under him after such a chaotic first year. But with your like you said, there, it's different to say it, but it's different to see it. What are you seeing from Missoula in your two postseason or regular season that just screams improvement or just more comfortable, I would say? Yeah, I mean, his first year was totally out of his control. Like he he went from a behind the bench coach to coaching one of the most, you know, premier franchises in the NBA, something he was wholly unready for. And it it obviously makes sense that he's going to have some some rough patches in that first year. And so having an entire offseason to not only build his coaching staff out and bring in Charles Lee and Sam Cassell and all these other guys to not only implement the philosophies that he wants to implement to not only like get this this group used to him, because he said on a podcast before the season, like last year, he didn't know what he was doing to the point where he was just trying to rely on the talent as much as he could because he didn't have time to prepare any of his own coaching philosophies. So going into this year, I think that onto the next mindset is the, the biggest thing. And the most important and interesting thing that I think a lot of people get mad at, ironically enough, from Joe Mazzulla is the lack of expectations. Like Joe Mazzulla, after the Celtics came down um, when they were, or excuse me, came back after being down by 18 in game three against the Pacers in the conference finals, he said, once we embraced that we were down 18 to the Pacers in the conference finals, it was fun. Like, like we were able to just loosen up, have fun and accept that. Cause like, the way he treats it is like th this expectation that the Celtics are supposed to win every game. Like they'll, they'll be playing the wizards or, or they'll be playing the Pelicans or, 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 or like teams that are probably not as good as them. And people expect them to beat. And he'll be like the expectation that we're supposed to win by 50 every time is ridiculous. Like these are NBA teams. Like they're playing hard too. We're playing hard, but they're also playing hard. Like we're not going to be up by 50 every single game. And so if we expect to win by 50 every game, 
then whenever we go down or whenever we're not doing that, it's going to be completely like impossible to come back from that point because we're just, like our mindset's going to be completely wrong. And so he, he said the most um, the healthiest relationship with success is to know that you can get better. He said, um, if you're going to sit back and be happy after every win, that's an unhealthy relationship with success. And it's going to come back to bite us in the, you, you can finish a sentence. Like, like he, he is just so committed to making this team understand that winning sh is not the expectation. It's the goal, but you can't go into every game expecting to win because that's going to put you in a position where it's not, you know, easy to win if you're not winning at the start. Like, like these Pacers games, like they won three close games because they were able to go in with the expe expectation of there can't be any expectations. And I really think that's an interesting mindset that a lot of teams like you'll, you'll hear the fans in the media saying you should want to go into every game wanting to rip people's heads off. Like they, you got to have this like insane, like nasty mindset. And Joe's just like, we just need to go into the game, accepting whatever comes our way, react to it and then win from there. And they've gone 12 and two in the playoffs. And so I think it works pretty well. Yeah. And you talk about that reactionary, especially within this conference finals. I'd love to, again, get rely on your eyes instead of mine, because I think what I see on screen on ESPN's broadcast or TNT or whatever it may be, might be completely different for what you're seeing from your seats in, whether it's Indiana, Cleveland, Miami. But what's really struck me out about, and was I, you can talk about whether this was a fair criticism last year or not, was their clutch time numbers. And what do they do when the, when the chips are really down, it's tight, is there too much ISO ball? But I saw three games, and I, I I can concede that game one against Indiana was certainly a gift in the way that overtime was handed to them, and Brown then makes the shot. But they had to still go win the overtime, and then come back game three on the road against Indiana, and then game four have to back and forth, find Derek White in the corner to win these games in close situations. Have you seen an evolution there, or have you always seen that narrative as sort of tired or maybe lazy in a sense? Because I always wanted to say, okay, I'm seeing this on the TV, but what am I seeing? What, what is someone seeing it in real speed, real time, where they're just focusing on the game instead of the noise of commentary or Twitter or that stuff? What are you seeing with your own? I keep saying, what are you seeing with your own two eyes? But we bring you on for your perspective, and I think it's important to get to see what you're looking at. Yeah, the Celtics, they weren't a great clutch time team at times this year. Like, I don't think that narrative is completely, like, overblown by the media like there, there are parts of how they play in the clutch that's less than ideal um like tatum didn't make many clutch shots um jalen brown made one like the only game winner they have this year is xavier tillman in like april which is like funny um but i think a big part of that is they just blow out so many teams like they're not in as many clutch games um and they're not in as many situations where they have to win at the buzzer and also like tatum is i think he's like over nine or something if you like none of the other players around the league are like, and, and he's over nine. Let me say on like game tying or game winning shots specifically, like he actually shoots all right uh, in the last five minutes, et cetera. But like in those very niche situ situations, he hasn't made them. And the only difference is like, sometimes he just doesn't make them. Like, like sometimes it can just be as simple as he just didn't make those shots. Like if he makes two or three of them, like we're talking about this completely differently because the Celtics win two more of those games and it's not as big of a thing. Um, I do think they go to isolation a bit too much in those situations. Like they don't, they don't run enough stuff and they have been running more stuff in the postseason, like to put the Der ball in Derek White's hands um, to run the offense, which I think is what they should be doing. And so they've done that in the postseason more um, than they did in the regular season, which is a good thing. Put the ball in Jalen Brown's hand uh, in game four too. So like they are shaking it up and I do think it's improved immensely in the postseason, but I don't think that narrative is like completely made up. Uh, I do think there is parts of their, their clutch time, play that leaves some room to be desired uh but i do think it's a bit overblown because I, I do think they've been better in the playoffs and for what it's worth those two nuggets games are the ones everyone points to and i think they played pretty well in the first nuggets game the nuggets just made tough shots and the celtics couldn't get theirs to go and then in the second one like jason tatum missed a wide open corner three to tie the game with like 10 seconds left like like there, there's like just two three different things that could have gone the other way and the Celtics would have won those two games and then we wouldn't even be talking about it so I, I do think it hasn't been great at times this year but I do think it's a bit overblown the, the whole clutch time thing yeah because I I, it's, I see the and it's I don't want to get into the whole talking heads there's there's eight days of airtime that they have to fill before the NBA finals so there's going to be some and you can take that as you will uh for the listeners but I, I love that perspective that and, the, and you talk about the mixing it up. It doesn't have to be all on Tatum. You've seen Derek White make big shots. Drew Holiday 
comes up with big plays. He's had a great stretch since the Cleveland series has begun, I would say. And just so many different pieces, and that's why you bring those guys in, is that it doesn't have to be all on Tatum or Brown, although they've been rather uh, to their standard in those last couple series. But when it comes to this NBA Finals, and we'll talk about, I, I would love to say let's get into Minnesota first, because I feel like they're probably, so just for the, the audience, we're recording this on Thursday afternoon. Game five is tonight. That Dallas may be very well be crowned the conference champions as I'm editing this podcast. But let's say Minnesota does the impossible and somehow comes back up down down three one in this series, and that would be just insane from an NBA perspective. A lot more basketball, but in the unlikely scenario, I just want to cover this first, just in case, because we, we got to cover our bases. Um, what do you like about Minnesota in that series real quick before we get into probably the likely favorite in Dallas to win this series and close it out here? Yeah, that would be unfortunate considering I may have hedged my bets and bought flights to Dallas already. So that, w- that would be less than ideal if Minnesota made history. Uh, no, but Minnesota is a great defensive team, and I think that's the biggest strength. I think the Celtics match up better with Dallas than Minnesota. I think they should be okay against either team. Um, but the the defensive pieces that Minnesota has – are built better to slow down the way the Celtics play offense. The Celtics play a lot of get to mismatch on uh, mismatches, play from there, play out of the situations. And the only real mismatch they could probably go at in uh, Timberwolves lineup is maybe getting Tatum on Towns or, or Conley, or maybe getting Drew Holiday on Conley in the post. Like call it uh, Towns and Conley are really the only quote unquote weaknesses. And even those guys have been pretty good defensively in the playoffs this year. And so, I think just them as a whole, they played the Celtics well this season. They brought them to overtime one game and the Celtics won that one and they beat them in a close game earlier, earlier in the season, like way earlier. Um, And they just did a good job of like clogging the lanes, making life hard, playing physical. And so I think that matchup might be less ideal for the Celtics, even though the Timberwolves offense leaves some stuff to be desired and the Celtics have a good defense. Um, But the Timberwolves own defense uh, in that physicality, I think um, could make life a little harder on the Celtics and the Mavs. Yeah, and I I always look at the Timberwolves offense, especially within this Dallas series, and I would have expected this to happen against Denver. Their half-court offense falls apart, it feels like, in certain situations, and Dallas has just been able to capitalize on Luka and Kyrie are ridiculous, and they're playing defense now. Uh, that's not something that, and we'll get into the, the Mavericks in a second, but yeah, that it's just the way sort of the Timberwolves are structured, I feel that Boston can't, as you put it, because they were mismatch hunting against Indiana, Cleveland. It's sort of... How can we best maximize our talent on our side versus what the Timberwolves are doing? But when it comes to if the but let's still stick on this if Minnesota situation, is there a situation now if Minnesota even gets to, to six or seven, but Dallas is still able to close it out and you add that added fatigue, the added strain on Luca's knee? Is that something that is as noteworthy as people might be making it? Or when it gets to the finals, it's just play the series that's ahead of you, regardless of what's happened before? Because we saw Miami get dragged last year with Boston to seven games. And Mm. I would be willing to bet that added some wear and tear on their skis playing a Denver team that swept the Lakers. I believe it was a gentleman sweeper sweep in that conference finals. They're fresh and Miami had just come off this seven game battle. Could that play a factor at all? If it ends up being Dallas or a miracle Minnesota. Yeah, I think it'll largely just be play the team in front of you, but I do think there is a small piece to that where like, the the more games Minnesota can drag this to, the better it is for the Celtics because obviously the Celtics will just be getting rest that the Mavericks can't have. Um, there's always the flip side to it, like, oh, Mavericks will just be in more of a rhythm if they keep playing and they won't have this huge time off and they won't be cold. They'll be, still be ready to go. But I think the fact that they were up 3-0, if this gets dragged to like six or seven, they could be like a little maybe frustrated that they let it get that far. Um, but by and large, I think it'll just be, you know, both teams will be playing the games in front of them, regardless of how tired or whatever they are. Like Lucas said he was tired after that game three, maybe. And Kyrie was like, yeah, that's how you should be. And so I think I think they're ready to play through uh, any potential fatigue and um, just battle. Absolutely. And shifting to Dallas, we all believe and I think it's no secret. They should probably close this out tonight or in a game six in Dallas. What they've been able to sort of piece together and what feels like such a short amount of time has been nothing short of remarkable. And I just love to get your perspective on how this Kyrie deal has worked out for the Mavericks in such a significant way. When the trade first happened last March, I was one of the first ones to say, this is not going to work. The the two highest usage rates in the NBA, it feels like two ball dominant uh, offensive users, both really highly skilled, but a little bit, I, I, I there's not a right word for it. Kyrie's had his, his pass with 
he's difficult. And then Luca sometimes gets a bad rep some for certain things. So I thought, okay, these it's a weird fit. But the more it started to work, the more you started to see the vision. Uh, Luca's having the, the load is taken less off for Luca. Kyrie has become a secondary ball handler and sort of taken quarters off. And then when he needs to turn it up, he does. It's been really fascinating to watch them. What has impressed you about Dallas in a potential finals berth against the Celtics? I think everything you just said, the way those two guys have played off each other has been super, super fun to watch. I mean, you could kind of see the vision with when they went on that Eastern Conference Finals run with Jalen Brunson and Spencer Dinwiddie, like Luca with another ball handler, like works, like they kind of saw that and were like, hmm, how can we capitalize on this? Maybe going to get one of the best guards in the league could be a good idea. And I think when it happened, people were low on it. I was low on it. Like you, like, how is that going to work? Both of them need the ball, but like they, they found a way to, to play off of it. And I think the underrated part um, that people didn't, consider i guess is like Kyrie is used to playing off the ball he played with lebron who is huge high you should trade guy they want a title and so you combine that with the the trade deadline additions of pj washington who's been on fire from three in the playoffs at times of uh, Derek lively who's hurt right now but he's been incredible for this team he's gonna be i think he's gonna be like deandre jordan uh in his prime with luka like he is so so good um Derek jones jr has been great they got him on a minimum he's playing great defense he's making some shots like they've just got a bunch of guys stepping up at the right time I do think the important thing for the Mavs this summer is to not fall in the, the Hawks trap, I call it, of Hawks made the conference finals and they're like, oh, we're good enough now. And so they just kind of plateau. I still do think the Mavericks need to keep looking to, you know, improve, you know, bring guys in, like, and stuff like that. Because I do think there are, like, I don't want to say flaws, but, like, they're, they're, this isn't an imperfect roster, I would say. But they right now they're playing above the level of the talent on the roster and that's a phenomenal thing and they deserve a ton of credit for that because guys have stepped up and Luca and Kyrie are the head of the snake obviously absolutely and when you look to this matchup before we close out with some uh talk about your pickup skills because I I'm curious to get your perspective I see the laughter there but we got to talk about when it's probably eventually announced or seen Dallas in Boston for you as a writer and the angles that you sort of can look further, obviously the storylines within this sort of series is rich. You've got the Kyrie to Boston factor. You've got Porzingis, who was tried as a co-star to Luka, and that ended up falling short. There's so many angles. I, I Boston's a big market. Mark Cuban and the Dallas Mavericks, how they've sort of maximized this roster. There's so many angles you can take. But for you, what are you most excited to look for? And do you see any potential X factors on both sides to sort of sway the favor and the Mavericks getting Luka getting his first championship or Tatum and Brown getting that monkey off their back and getting theirs. What are you looking for in this series? Yeah, I think the Celtics are probably the best equipped team to guard Luka and Kyrie that Luka and Kyrie have faced so far. Um, I think the Mavs defense is obviously, or excuse me, the Timberwolves defense is obviously awesome, but that was very specifically built to beat the Nuggets. And it was not specifically built to beat the Mavs. And you're seeing that because like, They've got two huge guys on that roster, neither of whom can stay on the perimeter with Kyrie and Luka. And Al Horford struggled at times there too, but I think he'll fare a little bit better than either of them. And you can almost sort of goad the the Tim, uh, excuse me Dal, uh, Dallas's guards and Luka and Kyrie to to come into the paint into Al Horford a little bit with the drop defense the Celtics play with Derek White chasing them around screens with Drew Holiday battling through screens like they've got the best two defensive guards in the league in my opinion or two of the top whatever four or five um like in in Drew Holiday and Derek White and you add on incredibly talented two-way wings and Tatum and Brown who don't get nearly enough credit for their defense I think they're set up pretty nicely to guard that Dallas team and the Celtics have done something all year where they're just like they'll, they'll live with some guys beating them and I think they're you're going to see a lot of Derek Jones Jr. open threes in this series and I'll, I'll tell you that now um, as far as the other like the flip side I think the Celtics offense has picked on mismatch hunting all year and like like I mentioned there aren't a ton of mismatches to pick on in a Timberwolves lineup there are some mismatches you can pick on in this Dallas lineup. Like you can make Kyrie and Luca, uh, like you mentioned, they've been playing great defense, but you can make them really have to defend. You can make them really have to get in the post. You can make them really have to keep up with Tatum on the perimeter. And I don't know if they're really built um, to do that as well. Um, I, I think the places Dallas might have an edge is that pick and roll. Like the Celtics have struggled a little bit in pick and roll um, guarding it this postseason. And I think that could be something you see Luca especially exploit. Cause obviously like that's his thing. He's incredible. He's like prime James Harden in the pick and roll, maybe better at this point. Um, I, I do think I'd probably pick Boston. You can call it green glasses or bias, but I just think they match up pretty well with this Dallas team. And 
I mean, the two times they played them in the regular season, obviously there's like, it's a different team now, but they smoked them. And, and so I, I think the Celtics match up pretty well. It's going to be by far their hardest series yet, but I think they can pick on some things in this Dallas lineup that other teams might not have been able to take advantage of. And I think this might be the best possible series we could have gotten in terms of an aesthetically pleasing NBA yes. finals. There's going to be a lot of skill on the court at all times. Luka, Tatum, Brown. I mean, not only is it storyline rich, but I think it's just going to be pretty basketball to look at. Not, I didn't even mention Kyrie Irving there. And that, I mean, there's going to be F Kyrie Irving chance, I'm sure, in the TD Garden, even though I think that's a horrible idea for Celtics fans to, yeah. to roll with. <laughs> it's it's a... Uh, it's a storyline that's certainly there. Uh, there's and there's the factor of Porzingis being able to potentially return. I, I, maybe if you've you've heard anything on his return, is he? I know he said something on Twitter about a poten- see y'all in the finals, which I don't know if that indicates I'm here game one or just see you in the finals at some point. Yeah, we we know nothing. Joe, you can ask Joe Mazzulla like, hey, did Chris Stops, you know, wake up this morning and be like, I don't know, man. I, I don't know. Like he's just completely <laughs> tight lipped, not saying anything. A- everything you ask him about Porzingis is, I don't know, I'm not a doctor. I don't know. I don't know. Like he's there, you're not learning anything. Um, you've seen him on the bike. He was doing some on court work in Cleveland in front of the media, like uh after shoot around. So we got to see him there a little bit. His tweet did say, like, oh, see you guys in the finals. So it does sound like maybe he's inching towards that return. Peyton Pritchard did an interview with Abby Chin of NBC Sports Boston during the Indy series where he said, like, oh, yeah, he'll be back. Or, like, oh, yeah, I think he'll be back. So th- there are, like, some s- slow rumblings. Uh, Joe Mazzullo went on Zolak and Bertrand, which is, like, a local radio show, and said, like, yeah, he's he's ramping up his on-court work. So it does sound like he's going to try to make it back for the finals. I was skeptical before we got this sort of influx of positive news because it just felt like he wasn't making a ton of progress and he wasn't even questionable for any these indie games but with the huge break we get before the finals if i had to guess i'd say he plays it's just a matter of how good he looks after getting right back on the court and do you feel that if even let's say the doctors go to missoula four days before game one and say hey the best he can be is 90 85 to 90 percent do they throw him out there and they risk it and say hey if you feel any tugs or pulls just get the heck out of there or you see them saying hey al's been playing great this playoff series let's just see what we can do without him first and then if we really need to throw him out there as even an offensive decoy just because of the size and the skills that he presents is there is there a possibility of saying hey you're not 100 percent, and if Porzingis is fine with it you throw him out there or is it absolutely not from their perspective I in my opinion I think if he's not 100 percent, you can't play him like it's the NBA finals I don't think you have really much room to, to mess around at the same time they'll like get the perspective of like there's there's nothing to be waiting for after this, like maybe the Olympics, but nothing in terms of the, the actual season that there is to be waiting for. And so maybe you want to test it out there. But I, I think then you run into the risk of if he's not 100 percent, he's going to be the one getting picked on and Luca Kyrie pick and rolls, which isn't ideal. So I, I would say you wait till he's 100 percent. If he's not 100 percent, you don't play him. That's kind of where I land. OK, and the final question before we get into some some quick rapid fire Jack's basketball prowess. Um <laughs> I think the big storyline that everyone's going to be talking about is Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown as a duo. And if it ends up becoming, let's say Dallas wins in six and Tatum puts up another finals series like he did against Golden State or the opposite happens and Brown and Tatum get this one. Like, how do you how do you see the, the narrative of that duo changing and how does it change with a ring versus Oh, and two in the finals after a significant haul in the offseason to try to get there, and they fall short of a Dallas opponent. They see Luka and Kyrie get a roster that was basically constructed in March, par- con- partially constructed in March, gets their first title. How, how do you see sort of that narrative playing out? Do you think it's potentially fair or unfair? It, it feels fascinating to me that this duo has done so much that that, that ring is the one thing that silences all doubt. Yeah. Um. I think it's tough to say. I think it depends on, like, if the Celtics went out and get swept, right? Then I think you really have to look at, okay, do we need to make a bigger change? Is there something more we need to do? Or do we just run it back and say, like, okay, we got the year of experience with this specific group and we try again? If it's, like, seven-game series, Celtics lose on a buzzer beater, like, can you really make a drastic change because they were, like, one shot away? Like, I don't think we'll see any massive changes next year regardless. I think you can clearly see that Tatum and Brown work together. I, I think more goes into a playoff run than just, oh, we have the most talent. Like there's luck. I think there's, you know, other team getting hot. Like there's a ton that goes into it. I think you're seeing the same Celtics team back next year, regardless of how this finals goes. 
that said, I, I think I, I think it's time. Like I think I think this is the year. I, I'm very confident about the Celtics going into this finals, even though some people might not be. Sounds good. So you got that there with the Celtics version. Last question before we wrap up, Jack. A video has surfaced on YouTube and Twitter <laughs> of the Celtics beat members gathering together for some pickup basketball. I'd love to hear mm. the origins of how that all got started. And if you want to drop some stat lines, I mean, the, we won't know. Only the Celtics beat writers. If you dropped a triple-double, you might as well just drop it on here. How did that go? And what was your assessment of your personal performance on the Celtics NBA beat pickup games? Yeah, so we played in Cleveland, too, a little bit. Um, then we got another run in in Indy. And CLNS put that video together. Amit, who's their camera guy. I can't lie, Amit did me dirty. That that was not a reflection <laughs> of how I played that day. I got It's like when you put like a highlight reel together and you can't look at a highlight reel to, to determine how good a player is because that's all the highlights. That was a low light reel, man. That was all of the bad plays I made that day. I, I, I genuinely think I played pretty well that day. I was driving the ball well. I made some shots later in the day. Um, but he was just, it was all of my mystery bounds. It was all of like, I, I was frustrated <laughs> that came out the way it did, but I, I, I'm an okay pickup player. I, I, like I said, I drive the ball pretty well. I'm pretty okay in the post. I can shoot. I'm like a streaky shooter. I'm not a great shooter, but if I make one, I can make a couple. Um, I'm okay. Defensively Jay King who writes for the athletic. He was there. He was on fire that day. He's better than all of us. He, he's like levels ahead. John Corrales is good too. He played pro back in the day in Greece. And so he, those two are pretty good. Um, I felt like I held my own and then the video just kind of made it look like I'm absolutely <laughs> terrible. So I was, I was a little bit mad at Ahmed. I might have to have some words with him, but all in all, like, I think I, I can stand up pretty well. I didn't play high school or anything like that. So I, I think I stand up pretty well based on my experience and just in general. We're setting the record straight here on the man with the plan <laughs> podcast that Jack is a damn good basketball player, setting it great right here. You could you could clip that however you want. Whoever at CLNS sees this <laughs> with their guy Jack, I am I am backing him up. They they got you on the GTA wasted thing. I thought that was brutal. That was so dirty. It was so dirty. I, I didn't deserve that. Come on, man. <laughs> so how, how does that get organized? Do you who who's the who's the real head honcho of the night? We got to go play some pickup basketball and get that rallied. I think it was mainly Noah Dalzell. So me Noah. Bobby Kravitsky of SI Media Group and Justin Turpin. Noah writes for Celtics Vlog and does work for CLNS too. And Justin Turpin works for WEI. We're the group that road trip together. So we're, we've gotten pretty close over, over the course of the season in the playoffs. So we're, we're pretty good friends now. And so we sort of organized it in terms of like going to play. So we just asked people like, hey, do you want to come hoop? We asked the CLNS guys like Bobby Manning and 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 um, I know Joe Sway Pavone played in Cleveland and, and Richie LeMay played in Cleveland too, but they didn't play in Indy. Um, John Corrales of Locked On Celtics was there. Jay King's the athletic. Um, and we just got a group together uh, and and hooped. We just asked a bunch of people on the beat. We got the people that were interested. And then we, we went there and played. Kari Thompson. Kari Thompson of Boston.com played in Cleveland. He is 6'6 and a former like football and basketball player. He kicked my butt in Cleveland. And <laughs> he was on one calf in Indiana, so he wasn't playing the whole time because he like hurt his calf a little bit. But when he got on the court, he still found a way to kick my like I just he's a mountain. I can't move him. But I love Kari. Shout out Kari. But yeah, me, Noah, um, Bobby and Justin, uh, Noah kind of spearheaded it and we just we kind of got a group together and uh found a way to get some runs in. And I will say the YMCA in Cleveland, like the nicest YMCA I've ever seen. It's huge. It's insane. <laughs> There we go. So if there, the, 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 when y'all road trip or get to Dallas or Minnesota, uh, is there going to be another pickup oh, game? Yeah. And can yeah, I yeah, get yeah, the yeah. exclusive rights to cover it? <laughs> absolutely. There will absolutely 1 million percent be a pickup game. We've already started oh. finding it. And I'll, I'll give you the update once we're done. Absolutely. I need I need the stat <laughs> line. I'll, I'll broadcast it. We'll get a whole crew. It'll be great. That, that's, that's what we need to uh, wrap this podcast up. I got exclusive rights for everyone that is curious. <laughs> and... Jack, do you have any final thoughts before we wrap up? Have any potential storyline predictions or stat lines for your your pickup or the NBA Finals? <laughs> no stat line predictions for the pickup. I just hope I can put on a better performance so I don't get slandered on social media next time. Uh, as for the as far as the NBA Finals, I think the Celtics have a real good shot. I think they're positioned perfectly to win this. I think Drew Holiday is going to be the X factor. He's been amazing all postseason. Uh, hoping to see Kristaps um, come out there and play well too, but. 
I think they're positioned well to 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 beat Dallas um, if everything goes to plan and they play their brand of basketball. So uh, I'm excited heading into that. I'm excited to go cover it. And thank you again for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. This was Jack Simone of Celtics blog and host of How About Them Celtics, one of my favorite personal Celtics podcasts. I'll drop it all in the description. And we might try to find that social media video of just so you can see the slander. <laughs> And we can we get Jackson Bolton board material for Dallas when they uh, eventually play pickup. But thank you guys for listening to another episode of the Man with the Plan podcast. You can find us on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Let's keep it rolling for the summer. Guys, thank you. And go follow Jack on Twitter for his NBA Finals coverage. Congrats to you, Jack, on that. Thank you guys for listening. Have a great day and take care.